The food sector from farms to food manufacturers largely did what we asked them to do. We asked them to create shelf-stable, cheap, starchy calories that were fortified with vitamins. And, and so if you walk down the cereal aisle today and you see these boxes and boxes of you know processed products fortified with vitamins, that was a very conscious creation of, of the goals of the last century. But we started realizing around 1980 that diet's more important than just calories and vitamins. And we sort of started saying, hey, maybe diets related to heart disease and cancer and diabetes and, and, and these other problems, you know, that challenge is we created this food system to address vitamins and calories, not overall health, metabolic health. Where we are today is shifting away from a focus on those 20th century priorities towards the 21st century priorities, which is brain health, longevity, gut health, good immune functions, less heart disease, less diabetes. And the science and the industry is, is trying to catch up and kind of retrench and, and refocus on these new priorities. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Simon Hill. Today's episode is with Professor Darish Mozafarian from Tufts University. To say we're hearing from one of the best is quite the understatement. Dr. Mozafarian is one of the most cited scientists on the planet, having had his work cited over 200,000 times by peer-reviewed papers. An MD with a fellowship in cardiovascular medicine and a PhD from Harvard. Dr. Mozafarian has authored more than 500 scientific publications on dietary priorities for obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases, and on evidence-based policy approaches and innovations to reduce diet-related diseases in the US and globally. Thomas Reuters has named him as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. In this episode, we focus on the Food Compass, a food scoring system that Dr. Mozafarian created with colleagues at Tufts University designed to help consumers distinguish between healthy and less healthy foods. The idea being, if for example, you're standing in front of the cereal section at the grocery store, you can quickly make the healthier choice. You might've seen the star rating system if you're in Australia or New Zealand, or perhaps the guiding stars in North America. Since the first paper detailing the Food Compass was published, there has been some rather interesting takes about the system on social media, a mix of positive and negative. Having read through some of the commentary myself, I thought, why not sit down with one of the creators of the Food Compass and learn about the tool, its strengths and limitations, and how it could be used in real life settings to improve health outcomes. With that, here's my conversation with Professor Darish Mozafarian. I hope you enjoy it. And if you do, please leave a review on Apple or Spotify. It helps a lot. Dr. Mozafarian, welcome to the show. It's great to be doing this with you. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, really look forward to speaking with you, Simon. I know bits and pieces about your professional background and I've, I've read quite a lot of your papers and, and no doubt you're one of the absolute giants in, in nutrition science. I think I looked up on on Google Scholar just before, and I believe your work's been cited over 200,000 times, which is just crazy. Uh, how has all of this come about? How would you kind of describe your path into medicine and then nutrition science and, and, and broadly sort of where your interests lie? Well, you know, it's a great question. I mean, I grew up in, um, you know, different countries and, and different cultures. And I think in that upbringing grew to appreciate the, the value of food. And um, my father had a major heart attack uh, when I was in high school. Um, you know, he, he was 47. I was I was 17 and and, um, you know, probably influenced my my, you know, um, interest to go into medical school and become a cardiologist. And um, what was shocking to me when I got to medical school and then did internal medicine and then did cardiology, that's all, you know, during that 11 years of training after, after university, we didn't learn almost anything about nutrition. And yet food and nutrition was to me pretty obviously the biggest issue facing my patients. And so that was 
kind of the first big um, career defining moment for me is realizing that the top cause of, of poor health in my patients wasn't being addressed by the healthcare system. And then the second, you know, I think career defining moment was when I started to read the science myself. This was in the late 90s. Uh, I said, at least I want to educate myself. So I'll read all the papers I can about food and nutrition and health so I can help my patients. Even in the late 90s, at the height of the low-fat diet craze, the science didn't support a low-fat diet. The, sci the science supported a you know, minimally processed, high healthy fat, low starch and sugar diet. You know, and yet that wasn't the prevailing dietary guidelines. That wasn't what we were writing for patients coming in with heart attacks in the hospital. That wasn't what um, USDA was promoting. So that was the second big realization that, that you can do really good science, but if it's not translated into policy, into action, into recognition, it, it, it's not going to do any good. And so through that work, through, through, the, through those experiences, um, as a physician, as a, as a public health scientist, as a nutrition scientist, I've tried to first you know, really understand what we need to eat to be healthy, and then to be sure that's translated into, into action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we kind of share a, a similar background there. The, you know, what you shared about your, your dad, did he, did he survive his heart attack? He, he did. And it was br brutal. I mean, he had um, a ventricular fibrillation arrest. He had a massive mm -hmm. uh, anterior MI and heart failure. He was in the ICU for weeks. I think he set the hospital record for, for weeks in the ICU. Nobody thought he would survive. But after months and months of rehab and recovery, he survived and, and went back to work and lived many more years. But it was a tough road. Yeah, gosh. Well, I, I had a similar experience. So when I was 15 so a couple of years younger than you and my dad was sort of early 40s in his 40s as well he also had a heart attack and it was just him and i together spending a weekend and um he ended up being air flown you know thank thank god for the healthcare in australia he was taken by helicopter to the nearest hospital because we were quite remote um, and they did manage to, to save his life and, um, you know, his health has since improved a, a lot, but that was certainly a seed that was planted for me as well. When I kind of, um, saw that transpire and I guess for the first time see, you know, how precious life is and, and how easy it is sometimes to take for granted our health and, and maybe not be fully aware of all the things that we can do to, to improve our health. Um, I'm interested. One of my favorite papers of yours is the History of Modern Nutrition Science paper. And you've published so many, so I'm not sure if you remember this exact paper, but it was published in BMJ in 2018, which kind of details the timeline of nutrition research since the early 1900s. And I thought it, it could be interesting here to, to kind of share this with the audience. It, it might help us flow into the core of this conversation with regards to how we go about getting people to eat healthier diets and what that means today. But could you give us a bit of a, a synopsis about how the landscape of nutrition and public health has changed over the past 120 years? Yeah. And, and first, you know, I'm, I'm just to go back to your experience as a teenager with your father, that must have been incredibly stressful. And, um, and yet it's not that uncommon an experience, right? Heart attacks remain the top cause of, of death in the United States and worldwide. It's the top killer. And it's mostly preventable with better lifestyle. And then, you know, right under that, if you add the kind of global pandemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes, which which are completely preventable with better nutrition, right? We're we're sort of all walking around very sick and and people are losing lives and losing productivity all around us because of preventable diseases. Um, so, so, um, so I'm so happy that your father survived that, that stressful experience. Um, yeah, that when I, I started looking at sort of, I was often asked, like, how did we get to this place where, you know, we were having the science seeming to change and our priorities change and why is food industry doing what it's doing? There's so many questions people have, and you don't have to go that far back in history to understand where we are today, you know, and, and I think the, the bottom line conclusion, and I'll walk us through it, but the bottom line conclusion is the food system we have today was a consciously created food system to achieve the primary nutritional goals of the 20th century, which it did do. And so we have a legacy 20th century food system 
with 21st century problems. And, and we, we consciously created that food system because of a series of historical events in, in the last century. And so to walk us through that, um, you know, people think of nutrition as, as kind of an ancient science. And of course, we've, we've, people have talked about food and its healing powers for, for millennia. But I would you know, say the birth of modern nutrition science was actually less than 100 years ago, 90 years ago. 1932. 1932 was the first vitamin ever isolated and synthesized, vitamin C. Think about that. Just 1932, not 1700s, 1800s. Modern history, 90 years ago, the first vitamin ever isolated and synthesized. And so for the first time, scientists could prove that a dietary factor, a nutrient in food could prevent or cure a disease, which in this case was, was scurvy. And, you know, people had thought for a couple of hundred years that that maybe citrus fruits could protect against scurvy. Um, that's why the British fleet put lime in their grog, which that why the British sailors were known as limeys. Um, but but they didn't know for sure what it was that for sure that citrus fruits could do anything until 1932. And from 1932 until about you know 1950 was kind of the golden era of vitamin discovery. So all the major vitamins were discovered, isolated and synthesized. And those vitamins were linked to their deficiency diseases. And so niacin uh, and uh, pellagra, thiamine and beriberi, vitamin A and, and vision problems, uh, and, and so on. And at the same time, the accident of history that is really quite important was what was happening at the same time from 1930 to 1950 was the Great Depression, which was worldwide, and World War II, which greatly led to great fears of, of, of food shortages. And so governments around the world said, there's all this new science that we need to have certain vitamins and foods to have a healthy population. We have f dangers of food shortages. We have a war going on. We have to deal with this. And so the birth of the recommended daily allowances, the RDAs that you see on the backs of all the packages was actually in 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt ordered the nation's scientists to let him know what, what the um, population needed to be ready for World War II. And so the birth of the RDAs was actually to address, you know, uh, vitamin deficiencies for fit population. And we have to step back and remember, you know, vitamin deficiencies are pretty rare around the world today, with the exception of some very poor populations. They've dramatically Im improved. But even in the United States in the 1930s, pellagra was quite common. Um, a berry berry was, was, not, was not uncommon. Rickets, vitamin D deficiency was quite common. These were really common diseases. So the first period of nutrition science from 1930 to about 1950 um, was really focused on vitamins and making sure we have the right vitamins in food. The second thing that happened in the, that century was the population explosion. The human population went up 400% in hundred years. So we went from about one and a half billion to six billion humans on the planet from 1900 to 2000. Simon, more people were born in hundred years and we're born in all of previous human history combined, right? And so we had to grow food for all those people. And, and there were predictions, books like The Population Explosion by, by Paul Ehrlich and others that were written in the 1960s, 1950s, warning that a billion people were going to starve by in the next 50 years because we didn't have enough food. And so that led organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation and others to, to fund and promote what became known as the Green Revolution, how do we actually dramatically increase production from our farmland so that we can feed this incredible population explosion? And that led from, you know, very biodiverse, small farms growing thousands and thousands of species of crops. At, at 1900, by the time we get to 2000, you have four or five monocropped species that have been highly bred to produce starchy, cheap, stable calories that can be grown acres wide and industrially produced to feed the growing population. And, and so those two things, the focus on sufficient vitamins and sufficient calories drove all of the nutrition and policy priorities of the 20th century. And, and so we achieved what we intended to achieve. We didn't have a billion people starve. Hunger has gone way down in the world. Vitamin deficiencies have gone way down in the world. And so before we start you know, criticizing industry, we should step back and, and be thankful, right? Like the food sector from farms to food manufacturers largely did what we asked them to do. We asked them to create shelf-stable, cheap, starchy calories 
that were fortified with vitamins. And, and, and so if you walk down the cereal aisle today and you see these boxes and boxes of, of you know, processed products fortified with vitamins, that was a very conscious creation of, of the goals of the last century. But, and there's, there, there's the but, uh, of course, we started realizing around 1980 that diet's more important than just calories and vitamins. And we started, started saying, hey, maybe diets related to heart disease and cancer and diabetes and, and, and these other problems. And so, you know, the, 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 the challenge is we created this food system to address vitamins and calories, not overall health, metabolic health. And, and so, you know, where we are today is shifting away from a focus on those 20th century priorities towards the 21st century priorities, which is brain health, longevity, gut health, good immune functions, less heart disease, less diabetes. And the science and the industry is, is trying in a you know, relatively quick time from 1980 to now to catch up and kind of retrench and, and refocus on these mm -hmm. new priorities. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the food industry, you know, really did help solve the, the kind of nutrient deficiency related diseases that we were seeing um, of the day in the early 1900s and helped people avoid malnutrition, as you say. And, and I think that's a good point. It is easy to kind of judge sitting in 2023 without the full context of, of kind of what transpired but were there other options were there other ways of going about it do you think with with the way the world was set up and logistics and supplies and knowledge at the time or was that sort of inevitable and we had to go through that we had to learn we had to get better with the science and um you know arrive at the the sort of position that that you kind of just spoke to there in the late uh, 1900s where we had more information and started to realize that, hey, you know, this has been a solution, but but perhaps we need to to sort of shift again and, and create a, a new food environment that thinks about people's long-term health as well. Well, as you, um, as you said, it's very easy to kind of look retrospectively and judge and, and criticize others. So I don't want to do that because you know we I wasn't an active scientist right at, at, at these time periods in these discussions in the 1980s and so on when, when this was happening so I think people did the best they could with the knowledge they had I, I think it was you know pe people were well intentioned I think there were some mistakes and mistakes happen and and they were you know unintentional I think one of those mistakes was when we started looking at chronic diseases around really around 1980 was the first dietary guidelines looking at chronic diseases and the studies to look at chronic diseases were like from the 70s like the seven country study Ansel Keys seven country study some other studies one of the mistakes that was made when i say we i mean scientists and, and public health experts and government experts is we took what had worked so well for vitamin deficiency diseases and we translated it to chronic diseases and so we said look we know for rickets we've identified the vitamin, it's vitamin D. And so if we give enough vitamin D, we'll, we'll have good bone health, we'll prevent rickets. So now we have a problem of heart disease, which was kind of the first major dis chronic disease to be looked at. And scientists and government officials said, what's the nutrient, right? We figured out the nutrient for rickets, we figured out the nutrient for scurvy, we figured out the, the nutrient for you know, eye problems. What's the nutrient for heart disease? And scientists said, oh, we think it's fat and saturated fat. And so let's get rid of fat and saturated fat and we'll solve heart disease. And, and today we're actually kind of doing the same thing with obesity. We're saying the problem is just calories. It's just people are eating too much and we just have to count calories, lower calories, put calorie warning labels on things, you know, do all sorts of things to lower calories and we'll solve obesity. That's not really working out so well. And so I think that was a mistake as we took this kind of reductionist view of nutrition, which is called been called nutritionism, where you break down a food into its little components and you find the components and you try to fix health that works for vitamin deficiency diseases quite well. Um, it doesn't work for complex chronic diseases related to our gut microbiome and our liver health and our brain health and our heart health, where it's, it's much more complicated. So I think that's one mistake. And I think the second thing I'll say is that the, these um, changes, which were well-intentioned, led to you know major major um industrialization of the food system from farming 
to supply chains, to retailers, to restaurants, to food manufacturers. And people talk about the food industry, they often think about food manufacturers, but I highlighted the whole list because there's, there's restaurants and retailers and farmers too. They've become sort of mega companies. And I think these mega companies have um, legacy goals and legacy products. And I think they've focused too much on protecting their legacy products rather than shifting with the times. And so I think that's been a mistake is, you know, they're, they're for-profit companies with a profit motive and they realize earlier than, than, than they made, they, they realized early on, I think that some of their products were not good for health, but they didn't change those products quickly enough. So I think that's mm -hmm. the second big mistake. So if, if we could go back to those 1980 guidelines when they were getting created and not be so reductionist, would that be being clearer as to what foods you we want people to eat less of and more of so considering replacement and and i guess i ideally like what the overall dietary pattern looks like is that kind of where you're getting at thinking about quality of food as opposed to single isolated nutrients um you know when i think about the 1980 guidelines one thing that gets brought up quite often is that the food industry just sort of reformulated and, and maybe people removed fat from their diet, but they, you know, started eating a lot more calories from heavily refined carbohydrates and, and perhaps that's not such a good move. Yeah, I think that was the probably the single biggest, you know, scientific mistake of, of the 1980s was blaming obesity and heart disease and ultimately diabetes, uh, even on and cancers on fat and that was based on very limited science um, in, in animal models and mouse models and some very limited cross country comparisons um, that have since been debunked, right? We've since proven in, in better observational studies and in trials that, you know, we not only shouldn't avoid fat, we should be seeking out healthy fats. Um, but what that did is, is it since the focus, the, the scientific, uh, you know, consensus at the time was to avoid fat, or at least the government consensus to avoid fat, it did lead to companies taking fat out and and um, and making these highly refined carb and, and sugar products that people thought were okay. And so I remember being even in college in, in the late 80s and 90s and in medical school too, that I would see smart people going and getting fat-free frozen yogurt, fat-free, you know, cream cheese spreads and bagels and eating that for lunch going, Oh, I'm eating a health, healthy lunch. And I remember thinking then that's insane, right? Like those are not mm -hmm. healthy foods. And, and um, you know, the rise of, you know, of, uh, you know, fat free cookies, right. That just all these fat, terrible, terrible fat free salad dressing, all these crazy products that, you know, don't, don't make a lot of sense. Um, so I think that was a, a mistake. I think it was mostly at the, initially well-intentioned, right? Companies are following the guidelines, right? But um, but the problem is when you have good intentions and then you create these mega products that make millions of dollars for companies, it's hard for companies to move away from those products quickly. Mm -hmm. If someone's wondering, what, what do you mean by healthy fats? Yeah. How would you explain that? Uh, well, I, I should I should actually go back because you asked a very specific question about kind of what should the dietary guidelines have said, and I didn't I didn't really really answer that. I guess I guess looking retrospectively, I don't know that they had all all the science. Although even the seven country study did suggest a Mediterranean style diet was the best. I think what we know now about a healthy diet, what I wish that 1980s guidelines had said was that you know it's about eating mostly minimally processed, fiber rich phenolic rich, bioactive rich foods like fruits, beans, nuts, seeds, um, whole grains, minimally processed whole grains, preferably uh, healthy plant oils, which we can talk about seafood, fermented foods, um, and then eating, you know, minimally processed animal foods in moderation. And so unprocessed red meats, poultry, eggs, butter, they're not really health foods in, in contrast to some people who think they're health foods, but they're not the worst. They're kind of neutral foods. You need those to have a balanced diet in moderation and then to avoid the refined starches and sugars um, and, and other highly industrially processed products like, for example, trans fats, you know, is a whole nother thing that grew. Um, so so when I talk about um, healthy fats, um, it's pretty clear that um, fats from plant sources are healthy. 
um, plant oils, um, avocados, all, all kinds of fruit, nut oils. I don't use the word vegetable oils because it's a misnomer. There are no vegetable oils. All the oils we have come from nuts, beans, seeds, or fruits. And so, you know, olive oil is, 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 is a fruit, for, for, for example. And so, you know, uh, oils that are from those, those foods we know are, are good for us or healthy from randomized control trials, many, many randomized control trials in, in, in people. They lower not only blood cholesterol levels, they raise good blood cholesterol levels, they, they lower glucose, they improve insulin resistance. Um, polyunsaturated fats actually improve insulin sensitivity and pan pancreatic function, beta cell function. So, uh, and, and at least in some studies, also lower heart disease risk. So we know that that those healthy, you know, vegetable plant vegetable plant oils are are, are good for us. Um, I think that it's an open question whether it's just the oils themselves or also the bioactive compounds that are in the foods as well, because fruits and nuts and seeds and beans and and most vegetables, what the, and most minimally processed whole grains, what they share in common is they have hundreds of thousands of trace compounds in them that um, have mild pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory um, endothelial function effects. And just as a couple of examples, EGCG in green tea, um, some of the flavanols in, in cocoa, you know, um, some of the compounds in, um, in, in coffee, um, oleocanthal in extra virgin olive oil, which gives you the burn at the back of your throat when you, when you have that, that's an anti-inflammatory compound. So those compounds are also in the oils. So I can't say for sure if it's the oils only or the oils plus those compounds in them, but it's pretty clear that that especially plant oils are healthy. And I would add seafood. You know, seafood oils are, are quite healthy probably because of the omega three. So so I think healthy oils to stick with our food based discussion would be oils from from plants and and oils from seafood are really healthy oils. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's that's a brilliant summary. Do you think if someone was sitting with us now who was part of the 1980 guidelines, now I'm not sure if you know anyone that was involved, but let's just pretend that someone's here with us. Do you think that they might push back a little bit in terms of kind of placing some blame on, on the guidelines for health outcomes and perhaps point to the fact that the, the typical adherence to the guidelines is quite low? So, uh, you know, the, the major recommendation in 1980 was to put, you know, refined starches and sugars at the base of the pyramid. Well, I should, I should rephrase that. They didn't say to put refined grains and starches, but they didn't differentiate between whole grains versus refined grains, right? All grains were okay. And American diets changed. And, and so there was a change and, and our, you know, consumption of starch and sugar went up considerably after 1980. Whether it was just due to the guidelines, I mean, I don't think it was just due to the guidelines. I mean, it was less expensive. Um, it was easier to make. Um, once Americans started buying it, right, it, 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 you could have more profits by selling this processed product that had had those 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 compounds in it. Lasted longer on the shelf. If you don't know, you know, fats go rancid, starches don't. So I think there are lots of other reasons they 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 went up. Um, so I, I I agree that we shouldn't be saying just dietary guidelines drove everything, but it was clearly the scientific recommendation to move away from fat and towards carbs that led to kind of an ex, you know a, an, an explosion of carbohydrate intake. And I I don't think it's car, all well, this is a, a <laughs> Nutrition is complicated, so I, it's hard for me to, to shift from one topic to the other, but, but it's not all carbs, right? I think that as we can maybe talk about, Simon, I'm sure you know well, I think that carbohydrate that's in natural fruits or in beans or as long as it's in its intact food structure for most people is not a problem. Um, it's really we're talking about um, acellular carbs. And so I like to think of, of foods that are have been extracted from their natural food structure and are, are no longer... Mm -hmm in any cellular form that the, the very right. most highly processed carbs that I think are the problem. Right. Again, it's the quality, the quality. of, of yeah. those carbohydrates similar to, to fat. So being a little bit less, I guess, reductionist and understanding that they're an umbrella term. And I often say, you know, when you think of carbs, it, it could be anything from a jelly bean to a black bean. And, and right. we, they're probably going to have a different effect on your health. 100%. Um, yeah. Would, 
population health improve if Americans could eat according to the current dietary guidelines as of 2023 that are in place that are kind of described at, at myplate.gov? A hundred percent. I mean, you know, I don't think the dietary guidelines are perfect. I, in, in, I don't think any scientist agrees with every aspect of them, but they're pretty darn good. And, and I think that uh, most Americans think we still have the, 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 the food pyramid, right? The food pyramid from 1992 was retired in 2000 or 2005. It was retired at least 15 years ago. We don't have a government food pyramid anymore. And yet people still remember that. And, and so when people think of government guidelines, it's often, I think, in a, with a negative perception. But the dietary guidelines starting really around 2010 and especially 2015 are pretty darn good. They, they say exactly what we're saying now. You should follow food, food-based, you know, you know, guidelines, not sort of just be reductionist and think about nutrients. You should focus on minimally processed foods and plenty of fruits and beans and healthy oils and seafood and, and fermented foods and other things. And so I think the dietary guidelines, you should eat minimally processed animal foods in moderation. So I think the dietary guidelines are actually pr pretty darn good. They're, they're not perfect, of course, and, and I think they could be improved. But if we follow the dietary guidelines, it's pretty clear from multiple long-term studies, you know, we'd be a lot healthier um, as, as a nation. And, and we're getting a failing grade. The, the, the government has put out an, an index called the Healthy Eating Index, which is a measure of adherence to the dietary guidelines, and 100 would be perfect. And the national average is about 58 out of 100. We're, we're you know, that's an F, right? Um, you don't have to be a professor to know 50 out of 100 is an F. And, and What's interesting is there's no group in the country, no age group, no income group, no education group, no racial or ethnic group that's getting above a 60. So it's not as though there's, you know, it's just a segment of the population that's eating. We're all eating poorly. Um, you know, I would say 99% of Americans are, are eating poorly. And if we ate more according to the guidelines, we'd be much, much healthier. That, that doesn't mean that's a perfect diet, but the dietary guidelines mm -hmm. would be a big, big improvement from where we are now. Mm -hmm. So what is driving that? You know, I know scientists have look at, looked at that, but we're going to sort of segue into these nutrient profiling systems and talk about the food compass. But if we think about the kind of low adherence to the dietary guidelines, you said that we're failing. What, what's driving that and, and sort of uh, how much of that would be driven by c confusion as to what is healthy, you know, sort of independent of other factors like price? Well, so I think the first and most important answer to the question is I don't know, right? I don't know exactly. I don't think anyone knows what's overall driving sort of population dietary shifts. We have theories and ideas, um, um, so, but, but I think the evidence does point to a few factors that all intersect together to, to drive that. And I think you mentioned two of them. I think one for sure is confusion and lack of consensus. Um, not so much among scientists, although there is controversy among scientists, but among the public, right, you'll have diehard vegans who say it's absolutely toxic to have any kind of meat or people who say it's absolutely toxic to have dairy, right, to then, you know, carnivores. We, there's people I've met who are carnivores who think that fruits and nuts are toxic to people and everything in between, paleo, low carb keto, um, and so on. So I think there's a lot of confusion among the public. And, and what that means is people sort of form their own sects and their own groups and their own like, you know, like-minded folks. And then um, misinformation gets passed around through social media and studies get taken out of context that support people's, you know, biases. And that leads to confusion. And that's a problem. I think number two is um, it is a little bit more expensive dollar wise to, to eat healthier in a grocery store, um, but it's not that much more expensive. And we actually have done research on this and published a paper on this, looking at all the studies around the world that have looked at price. We found that on average, it costs about $2.50 more per day per person to purchase a really healthy diet in a grocery store versus a really terrible diet. And so, you know, $2.50 is like less than a coffee, right? It's, it's not that much, but for a low income family, a family of four, a family of five, $10 a day, you know, multiply it over a year, you know, $4,000 a, a year, like that could be pretty significant um, uh, for, for, for price. But I think more important than, 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 than uh, dollar cost is the, the opportunity cost, the time cost. 
you know, you and I who think about our food and probably care about our food, it's hard enough for us to go to a grocery store, map out our food, buy it, bring it home, cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Seven meals for our families, for ourselves, for guests in a busy schedule. Imagine the average American with all the challenges, the average Australian with all the challenges or people in low-income nations. So I think there's huge opportunity cost. And so I think it's a combination of, of consumer confusion, huge opportunity cost generally to health, healthy eating. Healthy eating is, is harder to do, right? Much harder to do. It's harder to find the food, harder to cook the food, harder to, 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 to take care of it. And then there's, of course, marketing, right? Industry is marketing the highest um, um, uh, the, the products that have the highest profit margins and that pro the products that have the highest profit margins are typically the ones with the cheapest, you know, simplest, least healthy ingredients, right? And so that's dealing with, with marketing. And so I think you just, we just kind of have this perfect, perfect storm of, of a mess. And, and, and all of it's because of what we started with, which is the shifting science, right? The science has shifted, our goals have shifted, the food system has shifted and it's all happening in our lifetimes. This is all happening right. in our lifetimes. And we're not quite, quite caught up yet to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the sort of diet tribes and, and I guess dogmatic thinking in a way, certainly, you know, from my point of view, that's something that I've tried to kind of shine a light on, it, you know, getting people to realize that there's not necessarily a one size fits all, as attractive as that can be. You know, often we can fall into the trap of you have your N equals one personal experience with something and then you assume that that is the, the single way that everyone should eat and, and overlook the fact that, you know, come back to diet quality, what you're talking about. And, and we see some people seem to thrive on a higher fat diet to the next person. But if, you know, the common thread seems to be the coming back to quality and the overall dietary pattern. And as you say, is it rich in fiber? Is it healthy sources of fats? Is it low in ultra processed foods? And there seems to be quite a few ways you can kind of cut that up and achieve that, but that can be a little bit of an uncomfortable feeling for someone that wants a single answer. Yeah, no, you're right. And then it gets more complex because even among unprocessed foods, there's a pretty big range of healthfulness. And even among ultra processed foods, there's a pretty big range of healthfulness. And most of us can't, avoid completely ultra processed foods. I mean, most breads are ultra processed cereals, chocolate bars, desserts. Um, so, you know, you want to shop in the grocery store and identify the healthiest possible options, right? Um, you know, you still have to choose between, between options that look otherwise similar. Mm -hmm. Which brings us, I guess, to what you've been doing with the food compass. So there's, a lot of different, I guess, potential solutions to helping people make healthier food choices. You know, we hear about sugar taxes, um, marketing regulations, particularly market, marketing certain foods or food groups to children, and of course these rating systems. And I'm I'm in uh, in Sydney. We were speaking off air uh, over here. We have the health right? star. Isn't it? Health, Sorry, it's health star, right? The health star rating. Yeah, we we have the health star rating system which sort of ranks a, a food out of five and it's on a lot of foods it's not on all because it's it's not a, a, a mandatory it's a voluntary system um what can you tell us about the various sort of food rating systems used across the world and and how well they're they're working well i think you've even before we talk about that, you highlighted that there's no single silver bullet to, to fix the food system, but we can do this. We can actually fix the food system. We, we created the food system we have now from farming all the way to food manufacturing very consciously with the goals of addressing vitamin deficiencies and calories over just 50 years. And so over the next, at most 50 years, but hopefully less, over 20 years, we could fix the food system, but it's not going to be one solution. And so we have done a lot of work to outline kind of the policy solutions and, and we've worked on, on helping inform a national strategy in our country and, and trying to work with other nations as well. And it involves healthcare and food as medicine. It involves the power of, of, of regulation and, and, and you know, food, food regulation. It involves uh, schools and federal nutrition programs. It involves procurement. It involves science and advancing science. Uh, and it involves consumer communication and other things. And so first, 
there's no silver bullet and no paper. And we've done work on soda taxes. We've done work on junk food taxes. We've done work on on, on um, calorie menu labeling and, and many other things. And so, so you have to really have a, a suite of solutions to take care of this. And so um, I, I just raise that because, um, as I'm, I'm sure we'll get into, some people have misinterpreted our work on food compasses, though it's the answer to our food problems, where it's just one tool among many, many tools. So, yeah, so there are, and, and in the U.S., they don't, most people don't recognize this, but around the world, these food rating systems are very common. And so in Australia, there's the Health Star rating. In uh, the United Kingdom, there's the Health Star rating. In, in much of Europe, there's NutriScore. Nutri um, in Latin America, there's actually single nutrient reductionist systems, which are black box warning label systems in Chile, in uh, Mexico, in Brazil, uh, in, in other countries, there's nutrient profiling systems. And um, what all of these have in common is they, they try to take some nutrient information about a food, put it together in a guide and put it like on the label in a easier way fit for consumers to interpret what's healthier or not healthier. And they're not intended to replace dietary guidelines, you know, within the realm of dietary guidelines, if someone wants to buy a bread, they can look at the different breads and sort of choose a healthier one. Or if they want to get a dessert, they can look in the desserts and get a healthier one. Or if they want to get a frozen dinner, they can look in the frozen dinners and get a healthier one. So, so, so they're very widely used. And we looked about six, five or six years ago at the landscape of these, these food rating systems. Um, and, we noticed some common limitations. Um, you know, one of the most common limitations was that these tended to just focus on a few nutrients. And so going back to that reductionist, it tended to be fat, sugar, calories, salt, and maybe a few other things, seven, eight, nine things. And it's really hard to judge the healthfulness of a food based on seven or eight things. And so we thought that was a limitation. Uh, a second limitation of existing systems is that they tended to include some um, factors that we thought were outdated and shouldn't be focused on anymore. One of them particularly is total fat. Total fat's penalized in almost every system. Foods get a negative score for having too much fat, which I think is t a terrible idea. You want you know, foods to have more he healthy fats. Another example is saturated fat. All of these systems have saturated fat by itself as a negative point system. And we have done lots of work showing that saturated fat by itself shouldn't be a top priority for, for, for health and when you're, when you're judging foods. A third limitation is calories. All, almost all these systems give negative points for calories, which makes no sense at all, right? If you, it's better to have 120 calories of a healthy food quality than 90 calories of an unhealthy food. Why should we give a negative score to a healthy food that has 120 calories? So, so that was a second you know, limitation we, we, we saw. A, a third limitation was these systems didn't incorporate um, one of the most important things you and I have talked about, which is refined starch, refined grains. So um, added sugar was given negative points in almost all these systems, but not refined grains. And so a refined breakfast cereal or cracker or bread that has no sugar would get terrific, terrific points. And so in the United Kingdom, for example, English muffins, which are called crumpets, get terrific scores because they're 100% starch, no added sugar no fat and they look like, but they're not, that's not a health food, right? Um, it's it's mm -hmm. glucose in a package. And, and so that's a third big limitation. And then lastly, Simon, another limitation we noticed was that beyond kind of nutrients, they didn't, these systems often didn't look at other things like processing wasn't incorporated. Uh, a fermentation, which can be beneficial, wasn't incorporated. These bioactives and phenolics and flavanols weren't incorporated. Trace nutrients like omega-3s weren't incorporated. And so we said, look, these systems are being used. Can we do research to see if we can create a, a better system that, you know, is more holistic, uh, incorporates refined grains and starches, incorporates things like processing and fermentation, doesn't penalize foods for having fat or calories, uh, and um, compare it to existing systems. And, and, I'll, and again, I'll, I'll step back and say, I don't want to be too critical of existing systems. I think health star rating and NutriScore are pretty good. They're pretty good systems. They're not, they're not terrible, but we just wanted to see if we could build a better system. Friends, just a quick intermission to tell you about my brand new recipe book, Plant-Based Ferments, a collection of must-have recipes that will take your fermented food game to the next level, nourishing your microbiome and saving you dollars on your grocery bill at the same time. 
the soy labneh and homemade kombucha are probably my favorites. I'm often asked by folks in the community how best to support my work. I don't sell much, but if you have been getting value from the show and you want to show your support and improve your gut health, then check out Plant-Based Ferments. It's $12, has a few thousand words I wrote on fermented foods, including some frequently asked questions and 15 recipes that are professionally shot and styled. To get your copy, head to theproof.com forward slash ferments. Let's double click on saturated fat just for one moment and then I want to continue and and sort of understand a little bit more about the kind of algorithm behind the food compass. But if someone's listening and thinking, oh, I thought swapping you know calories from saturated fat for polyunsaturated fats would be a good idea for cardiovascular disease health, are you, are you not a, a subscriber to that kind of replacement? Well, so I think the evidence is really clear that, that eating healthy unsaturated fats from plant sources, in particular polyunsaturated fats, is really good for cardiovascular disease. And that there have been trials actually swapping that for saturated fat sources, usually butter, and showing that cardiovascular disease risk goes down. And that's what the dietary guidelines say, and that's accurate. So that is accurate. But on average, saturated fat from all sources, on average, has similar health effects as carbohydrate from all sources. And so the science is also pretty clear. If you just lower saturated fat and you swap it for carbohydrate, which is actually what most people do in practice, you don't get any health benefit. And so if you just buy a low saturated fat food and end up eating, like you, you buy skim milk and, uh, and you end up eating more carb, eating more bread or crackers, you're not doing yourself a- 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 any good. And so the way I look at saturated fat is, is for, on average, it's kind of a neutral nutrient. There's nutrients that are, that are, better for you and there's nutrients that that are that are worse for you which is also consistent with kind of the health effects of eggs and butter and unprocessed red meats on average more or less kind of a a neutral food and so and so eating more plant-based fats polyunsaturated fats in particular is definitely good for you simon but you could just eat more of those and replace anything you could replace protein you could replace carb you could replace saturated fat and so i think this idea that saturated fat itself should be specifically called out, I think is not supported by the evidence. And then secondly, saturated fat is not one thing. There's actually many different types of saturated fat depending on the number of carbons in the fatty acid molecule. And so coconut oil, dairy, red meat have different types of saturated fats. And it's very clear that those different saturated fats have different lipid effects, blood cholesterol effects. Um, do they also have different long-term health effects? That's less well studied, but I think the evidence suggests they do. And so that's another reason not to group together all saturated fat, because it's, it seems that, again, the saturated fat in, in milk or cheese or yogurt is not the same as the saturated fat in, in mm-hmm. red meats. Yeah. So you evaluated over 8,000 foods and drinks. And if I'm correct, each, each food and, and, and drink that was evaluated within the, the food compass was scored between 1 and 100. And there was a, an algorithm that was kind of uh, behind that calculation, which, which factored in all of these things that you're talking about, um, which you built on the basis that there was better science or more up-to-date science that could be used to create a system that would improve upon what is already out there. Can you, can you elaborate any further on, you know, at a high level, what that algorithm looks like, what, what were yeah. the, the, the various kind of domains and, and bits of information that were being pulled on? Yeah, so we put together a really good scientific team, you know, researchers who studied global nutrition, who studied um, kind of phenolics and bioactives, epidemiologists, economists, to really say, like, let's start with the science and what would we build if we could start de novo? And so we we built a system that scores foods across nine domains or areas. And so I think that's first important is the other scoring systems, just the, the points are added up in kind of one bucket. We have nine buckets. And what's why that's important is it makes it harder for industry to game the system because if there's nine domains that, that each contribute to the score, you could change the food to change one domain, but if you don't change the other eight domains, you're not going to change the score that much. And so it, it really helps kind of stabilize the score and prevent industry from, from, from gaming the system. And so I won't go through all the nine domains, but I'll go through some of the ones that seem to be the most important. And so one of the domains we, we, we created, which is 
really pretty new, was a domain around overall carb quality, overall fat quality, and overall mineral quality. And so how did we, we judge those three things? We judged overall carbohydrate quality using the ratio of fiber, dietary fiber to total carbohydrate. And other papers have been published. The reason that works is it kind of gives you a rough estimate of the whole grains and bran versus refined starch and sugar in a food. And why the carb to fiber ratio works well, it works better, say, than just added sugar is because, again, it, it, it starts to capture the refined starch, not just the, the sugar, the refined grains. And it gives positive points for whole grains and, and, and bran. That kind of gives an one overall measure of, of carb quality. As an overall measure of fat quality, we looked at the ratio of unsaturated fat to saturated fat. And so that's more meaningful than just saturated fat alone is kind of the ratio, the relative amount of healthy fats you're getting versus saturated fat. And then for sodium, we looked at the ratio of sodium to potassium, the, the kind of the mineral quality, because there's really good evidence that sodium raises blood pressure and raises risk of stroke, but potassium counteracts that. And so um, you don't want to judge a food that has, let's say, 200 milligrams of sodium the same if it has no potassium or if it has a 200 milligrams of potassium too, right? You should get a food that also has some potassium that will offset some of the harms of sodium. So that was one domain, the nutrient ratio domain. Another domain we did had food ingredients. And so, for example, the amount of beans, the amount of fruits, the amount of whole grains, the amount of yogurt uh, in a food. Uh, another domain we had was was vitamins. And so multiple vitamins um, that could that could, you know, get positive scores if there's more vitamins. But we only picked a few vitamins for each food or we or we only allowed the top vitamins for each food to give positive points to to prevent gaming the system from fortification. If you just poured vitamins into a food, right, and made all, multiple high, it wouldn't give that many extra points. You could only could go so high. We did another one with with minerals, um, um, things like magnesium and calcium and other minerals. We also had a domain on processing, and I think this was really important. For the first time in a, in a food rating system, we incorporated um, the Brazilian uh, system, which gave negative points to ultra-processed foods. And so even if all the nutrients look the same and all the in ingredients look the same, if it was more processed, it, it got negative points. And we also gave positive points to fermentation, as I mentioned earlier, you know, something that we think is, is potentially good, good, for, good for health, for food. So those are just some examples. And so overall, we had about 50 different attributes we measured across these nine domains. And importantly, I, I just want to, I'm sure we'll get into this more, Simon, but I just want to emphasize that this was a research project, right, trying to see if we could figure out if the system worked better. We came up with the principles ahead of time. We applied the principles and then we saw how it worked and we published the paper. We said, here's what we found, here's what it looks like. And we compared it to NutraScore uh, and the Health Star rating uh, as, as two of the you know most common systems. Mm -hmm. And I think there might be some, some confusion about this, but I had seen some people suggesting this was the food industry. They were behind this and creating this as a kind of way to self-regulate. Is that, is that accurate? So one of the faculty members on the project in term, when we were getting you know, funding for the project did get funding support from Danone. Um, and so Danone did partially support the project. I didn't receive myself any research funding from, from, from Danone, but some of, one of the faculty members got a grant. And the reason for that was Danone at the time, which is a big European company, was facing a decision about whether or not to use NutraScore in Europe because NutraScore was being pushed in, in Europe. And, and I think Danone didn't love Nutrispor because of some of the limitations it had. Um, interestingly, while they funded the, the project, while we were doing the research, they decided to use Nutrispor. And so they used Nutri Danone now <coughs> voluntarily reports Nutrispor on the front of PAC. So Danone funded the project. The National Institutes of Health also provided some, some funding for the project through an, an existing grant. But in both cases, the research was totally initiated by the research investigators. It was our idea. It was our plan. We developed the protocol. We developed the science. We did the analysis. We interpreted it and we published it. Um, and they had no role in any of that. Um, and so um, I think Danone had interest, you know, given that they have some healthier products like, like you know, un unsweetened yogurt. Could we come up with a better system? And so I think they were interested in supporting our, our, our research. But this wasn't 
a food industry product. This was a scientific product created by a university with mm -hmm. joint funding from food industry and from uh, the National Institutes of Health. Mm -hmm. Is there any pressure in that sort of scenario? And I'm just playing devil's advocate here and kind of asking questions that I, I think people might be interested in, in, in delivering a result that the, the funder would be pleased with? Well, I think, you know, this is an, a very important question about um, kind of private sector funding for research generally, right? Um, you know, private sector companies fund engineering research, they fund farm, pharma research, they fund um, medical device research, right? And, and they fund food research and really research in, in all fields. And in all those cases, there's definitely, I think, pressure um, for the investigators, if they want to continue to get funding from that source to deliver results that the funder likes, right? So I think that's always something that good investigators have to keep in mind. Um, I wish that there was enough federal funding, nonprofit funding, so that you know no academic investigators have to get industry research. But that's just not not the reality. And separately, if we have time, we've we've talked about the need for a major new investment in national federal science research, because we, we need more science research. So I think it's a real concern. And so I think, you know, good scientists, what you have to do is to sort of put up the guardrails. And so as I, as I mentioned, you know, develop the science ahead of time and, and make sure that the protocol and the plan and the design is independent from the funder. Do all the analyses and publish the work, you know, independently. Um, in this case, there was no interest, you know, uh, uh, in, um, uh, there was no interest from Danone in using the, 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 the scoring system because, as I said, while the research was ongoing, they, they made the decision to use, to use Nutri-Score. Um, but I think it's a, it's a real concern. I mean, I've never been funded. My research, is, my research has never been funded by food industry. Uh, I've tried to avoid that just because of the, to avoid the, the perception of conflict of interest. But I think it's un, also unfair to just automatically criticize science that, that is funded by industry or, 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 or criticize scientists. So, so I think um, it's complicated. I think, Simon, um, as scientists, it's our jobs to be aware of that and to do everything we can to avoid that. I think for the vast majority of scientists, if that does happen, it's unconscious, right? Not conscious. And so I think we just have to be really careful to avoid that. Okay. So you have this kind of up dated way of scoring foods there's these nine different domains you just spoke about a few of those and the idea there being that this will help prevent or uh, reduce the likelihood of the food industry sort of gaming things um and and, and, and be more be a more accurate you know depiction right. of health like through what we talked about having more, you know, science-based um, attributes mm -hmm. that are scored than, than, than in existing systems, right? I mean, that's the, the first goal is to just make a better system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us about some of the kind of major things that you, you observed when you ran these 8,000 plus foods and beverages through the system. Yeah. So, so we did, we did two things. So first we ran them through the system and compared them to health star rating and, and Nutri-Score but we also then in a separate paper, which we can talk about, said, OK, now what if we look at people's diets and what people are eating? If they eat foods with higher scores versus lower scores, do they have better health? And that's really the ultimate validation. But first, you know, before we get to that second paper, we just looked at how this compares to health star rating and Nutri-Score and how it just kind of makes sense compared to what you'd expect from diet dietary guidelines. And what we found on average is that the system works pretty well. Um, and it works better than the existing systems. And, you know, when you score 8,000 foods, right, you have to kind of look at the, the average effect. And some of the key differences we found is we tended, compared to health star rating and Nutri-Score, we tended to give higher scores to um, fattier foods that were, you know, healthy. So like nuts and seeds, nuts and seeds and, mm -hmm. and, and extra virgin olive oil tend to get pretty low scores on health star rating and Nutri-Score or, or some of these other systems, but got really good scores with our system, kind of highlighting, again, we're not penalizing fat, we're giving points for, for positive points for healthy fats. Um, also, really importantly, um, our, our scoring system gave really low points to refined starchy cereals and crackers and breads. And so like white pita bread and like a, you know, a, a, a corn-based 
cereal that might be marketed as healthy and crackers and things like that tended to get very low scores. So on a score, scale of one to 100, they tended to have scores like less than 20 or 30, all these refined starchy products. And that was a big difference from some of these, uh, from, from some of these other products. Our, our scoring system also gave um, lower points to processed meats. You know, we, we, we think there's like salami and low fat deli meats and all these meats, especially low fat processed meats. Because these other scoring systems penalize fat, something like a low fat hot dog or a low fat processed bologna tended to score pretty well in these older systems. But in our system, the processing, you know, was was negative enough it, and 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 they didn't get very very good scores and so on average the the system worked pretty well and and you know the the real test of the system is within a category like within meats or within eggs or within cereals or within breads you sort of line up and rank the the items and say does this make sense right and it and it made mm-hmm. sense it kind of made sense and fit with with health that if you kind of ranked from from high to low within any category of foods um where mm-hmm. There was some, you know, area for improvement that we that we noticed, um, and and other scientists noticed after we published the paper, is that across categories of foods, maybe there could be better scoring, and so that was something right away we we started to think about and, and are working on. So it wasn't perfect, but but on average, it worked better than existing systems. Mm-hmm. So you say that you're working on. On that, so this is kind of a work in progress. You can constantly upgrade that algorithm to to churn out results that you think better reflect the science. Yeah, and and I, you know, not constantly because if we constantly do it, it won't be useful, right? It has to be a, a tool, so it has to have some stability. But NutriScore and Health Star rating, which we've talked about, and there's there's others, right? They had you know multiple published papers over many years before they were put into practice, and so similarly with with Food Compass. Um, this is first and foremost a science project, a research project to see if we can develop a better system. And it's going to take a few papers and, and a few years of work to, to get it there. So so the work we did in follow up is, is we then asked the question, Simon, OK, it looks like it works better. Um, what about if we actually apply this to people's diets? And so we took a national data set of uh, almost 50,000 Americans and what they reported eating um, in, in detail, the detailed products and brands that they reported eating. We scored every f- food they ate, almost 60,000 products now, according to Food Compass. And then for each person, we created an energy weighted individual Food Compass score. So, you know, what you ate, Simon, weighted by the calories of the Food Compass score. And we saw how does that relate observationally to, to health in these, in these almost 50,000 Americans. And we found on average, it worked really, really well. And so people who had higher individual food compass scores um, had lower blood pressure, a lower LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol, higher HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol, lower triglycerides, lower body weight, low, lower body mass index or less obesity, lower glucose, um, lower hemoglobin A1C, which are you know markers of, of diabetes. Uh, and so across kind of biomarkers, people looked healthier. And then we looked at prevalent diseases. How does the person's food compass score relate to prevalent diseases? And people had a low risk of heart disease, a low risk of cancer, and a lower risk of metabolic syndrome if they ate foods with higher food compass scores. And then lastly, we looked at risk of of all-cause mortality, dying from any cause, which is kind of the ultimate outcome, right? Do you actually live longer? And we found that people with higher food compass scores actually live longer. And so this predicted lower all-cause mortality. And so that was a very important validation because again it showed on average if people choose products with higher scores you know they they have better health um, and and then and then um, and now I, I can pause if you want to you know have, make any comment but I can tell you kind of what we're doing now now that we've published those two papers yeah couple couple questions so on on that validation study you may have mentioned it but when you say people that were scoring higher on the food compass they had uh, biomarkers which reflect I guess lower risk of disease and then when you actually looked at disease outcomes they had lower risk of disease and also lower risk of premature death total mortality um, is is that uh, comparing sort of high food compass scores to low or is that comparing just the food compass against other nutrient scoring systems so if if you score high on the food compass system are you at less risk of disease relative to someone who say scores high on another tool 
We haven't done that paper. That's a really interesting analysis. Um, so that would be something to, to do to do next. What we did is, you know, Food, food Compass scores foods on a scale of one to a hundred, with a hundred being being better and, and one one being lower. And generally, you know, we think that foods from like seventy and up are foods to be encouraged. Foods that score sort of thirty to sixty nine are foods to eat in moderation, and foods that score less than thirty are foods to be minimized. You know, there's no food you never need to eat, but but just kind of, you know, thinking about stuff to minimize, stuff to eat in moderation. And and so when we looked at an individual person's score, um, we looked at for every 10 points, um, a, a difference in the food compass score. And so, for example, um, for every 10 points higher food compass score of an individual's diet, they had a 7% lower risk of, of premature death, which is a lot, right? 7% mm -hmm. um, lower for just 10 points difference. So we, we compared higher versus lower food compass scores. We haven't done the comparison with other nutrient profiling systems, which is an interesting, you know, separate research question. Mm -hmm. Sure. And the, the food, the comparison across food groups, you know, from, from my sort of read on uh, other scientists talking about the, the food compass, there seemed to be a lot of attention on, on a particular example where, uh, folks were pointing to like Lucky Charms or Honey Nut Cheerios or Frosted Mini Wheats, which I think people, when you when you sort of hear those foods, you just think that's an ultra processed cereal. Um, and people were pointing to the fact that that some that those foods were ranking higher than say boiled egg or, or ground beef. Is that is that a limitation of the system or um, is the system working correctly and and you do see that those foods that I just mentioned there, like the honey nut cherries and lucky charms, which are often fortified with vitamins and minerals, et cetera, as better options than ground beef and, and boiled eggs based on current diets. Well, so, so first for, you know, fortifying cereals doesn't give them much higher scores. And so, as I mentioned, we sort of set up the system so that fortified vitamins wouldn't change a difference. So, the only reason a cereal, a breakfast cereal, would have a higher score is if it had a lot of whole grains and fiber, um, because that's whole grains are recommended by the guidelines. Whole grains are pretty consistently um, linked to, to better health in observational studies, and also randomized controlled trials show that whole grains are healthier. So, so the food industry, to many people's surprise, has, for some, you know, traditional brands over the years stealthily introduce whole grains into, into those cereals. And so while people might not recognize it, some of the kind of iconic brands, which used to be just refined grains, are now the number one ingredient, the first ingredient is whole grains. They're still a processed cereal and they still have some added sugar. And so generally what Food Compass, what the rating has found is that if a, if a cereal is all whole grain and doesn't have added sugar, it tends to score pretty high. If a cereal is all refined grain, whether or not it has added sugar, it tends to score very, very low. And then cereals that have whole grain as the first ingredient and have dietary fiber, but also have some added sugar, tend to score in the middle because they're processed, they have whole grains, but they have sugar, so they kind of score in the middle. So obviously as a ranking system among cereals, that makes sense, right? If you're just choosing among cereals, you're gonna make a sensible choice. But if you then take the system and you say, well, how does this compare to scores for eggs or how does this score compared to scores for meats, um, eggs and meats scored better than the refined starch cereals. And that's something that I think some of the critics didn't highlight, which I think to me is kind of a bummer because our system is the first system to penalize refined grains. And so we actually score eggs and poultry and cheese and meats higher than most refined grain breakfast cereals. Mm -hmm. But as you mm -hmm. outlined, whole grain breakfast cereals that have a lot of whole grain tend to score better and eggs and now, poultry scores pretty well, but they tend to score better than some some eggs and some meat, or about the same. Eggs at least tend to score about the same, um, but especially red meat score score worse. So I think it, you know it's it's definitely something that we are looking at and and looking to see if we can make the system work e even better. From like you know first principles about nutrition, I think of again eggs and poultry and unprocessed red meats as kind of neutral, you know, kind of. 40 to 60 scores, if I had to kind of roughly put, you know, the category. And would I eat most refined breakfast cereals? No. Would I eat most breakfast cereals that have whole grains and a lot of sugar? No. 
So, you know, I, I think that is an area for improvement. Um, but, you know, this was a, what I think happened with some of the criticism that went kind of viral on, on social media is sort of very valid scientific questions about, well, is this the best algorithm? Can you fix it? Maybe you need to adjust the algorithm. Those are all quite valid. But, but I think what went viral was that we were recommending this or that we were saying this is a healthier food when what we, were, what we had done was publish a single research paper based on you know, our best principles and, and, and publish it for feedback, gotten that feedback, and they're now taking that feedback to, to improve it. So, so I don't think that um, most of these breakfast cereals are healthier choices than let's say eggs, or depends on how you cook the egg, definitely not healthier than, than certain egg preparations. Um, but the criticism did pick out out of 8,000 products or in our second paper, 58,000 products, the exceptions that would lead to the most shock value. And so, you know, Simon, before we started, you said, you know, you tend to do thoughtful podcasts, you tend not to do clickbait media. I feel like some of the criticisms were clickbait criticisms, like trying to pick shock value products, because we have plenty of egg dishes that have like an egg omelet with vegetables and cheese that score really, really well. And we have plenty of cereals that score really, really bad. And nobody created a graph to show that, right? People p created a graph to show the other direction. So, so yeah. So I think I think they there there are they 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 were valid criticisms of things we could have done better, but I think that they were taken a little bit out of context of the overall study and our overall findings across all the thousands of products. The internet tends to do that. Not not shocking at all. How would you go about? improving it so based on the feedback that you've got and 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 kind of now that this was published i think the end of 2021 you've had some time to sit back with your team no doubt and talk about it what what are you know if any of the the little tweaks or changes you'd be thinking about introducing yeah well so first i mean to go back to the misinformation i mean for me it was it was just kind of a, a bummer because i've spent most of my career turning over sort of some of the the conventional wisdom about fat being bad for you about you know saturated fat being demonized we published one of the first papers saying unprocessed red meat is probably a you know a neutral food it's probably not the worst thing in the in the, in, in the food system uh, and we published plenty of papers on ultra processed foods and refined carbs being harmful and we created a system to actually show that. <laughs> and so, and on, on, on average across all the thousands of products, our system does show that. And so first it was kind of a bummer to me personally to have my work kind of turned, flipped exactly on its head. And, you know, some of the, you know, people that read the social media posts and didn't have the time to go into the background, I don't blame them, like they're busy people, but it's just, if they actually knew what we did, they'd be like, oh, this is a pretty good system. Like this is better than, health star rating in Australia are better than Nutriscore. So that's the irony that like, not only was it, um, like you said, over oversimplified, but it almost was the opposite of what we found um, in, in reality. Um, but but I, when we are, in terms of next steps, so we published the, the first paper in 2021, then we worked for the next year on the second paper, which I mentioned, which was to extend Food Compass to individual diets and look at health outcomes to see that's actually the final you know, um, most important test is do people who eat foods with higher scores have better health outcomes? And we showed that it did. So that, those were our first two important papers. And we just published that second paper a few months ago. And so now that we've published those two papers, science takes time, we're, we're moving to the next step. And so we're specifically thinking about this particular question of, of processing. We've, we've already incorporated processing as a negative. But did we incorporate it appropriately? Did we give it enough weight? Should it get more weight maybe that processed foods maybe get, get more weight? That's one question. A second thing we're looking at is added sugar. We already gave negative weight to added sugar. It's already a, a characteristic that has, that has negative weight. But is there a different way we should score it? Should we maybe combine it with refined grains? Because I mentioned we gave negative points to refined grains. Should we try to combine it together um, and, and, and think about that? Um, a third thing we're thinking about is um, whether dairy fat should get different scoring than, than fat from other animal sources, like red meat in particular. 
That I'm not as sure about the science because there's some science that suggests that dairy fat is pretty neutral or maybe even beneficial. We published a lot on that. Um, in contrast, there's really no science that red meat fat is beneficial. So that's another question we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we're also, you know, looking beyond sort of thinking about those things about, you know, added sugar and, and processing and, and, and dairy fat. We're, we're also um, thinking about um, extending this to other data sets, right? So, so we've, we've scored, as I mentioned, you know, now nearly 60,000 products, but there's hundreds of thousands of products around the world. And so uh, Japan, there's investigators in Japan who have reached out to us and said, look, we'd like to think about creating a Japan food compass that takes the best things from food compass and creates a nutrient profiling system for Japan. Um, researchers from the University of Ghana have reached out to us and said, you know, in Africa, there's a lot of processed and packaged foods. People are very confused. Could we create a, a system with Ghana? And so that's the other work that we're trying to do is to work with the University of, of Ghana and to work with uh, researchers in Japan so we can extend the system. But but yeah, I really want to emphasize that this is science. This isn't yet, we're not, you know, we, we haven't created a new dietary guideline for people, right? We're just creating a food rating system uh, as a research project to see if we can create a better system than, than the existing one. Yeah, well, I think, you know, that viral kind of rhetoric was, you know, here's the, here's the the government and the food industry trying to get you to eat Lucky Charms. That's what it was simplified down to. And ironically, there's thousands and thousands of processed products that scored really, really poorly. <laughs> so if, hmm. I don't think the food industry would like most of the really negative scores that a lot of the processed products get with the food companies. Mm -hmm. Your point on, on dairy fat is really interesting because, again, I can see how it'd be difficult. It's difficult to to assign a score to dairy fat when whether or not it's beneficial or neutral could be determined by what someone's eating instead of. So, how do you go about sort of scoring it in isolation? Well, so so you know the the one key point about all of this is is nutrient profiling systems or food rating systems are not intended to replace dietary guidelines, like nowhere in any of these systems that have been created, NutriScore, Health Star Rating, which are, you know, again, pretty good systems, our system, none of them are intended to replace dietary guidelines. They're intended to help people within the choices that you're making choose a healthier product. So, so for example, if, if these systems were intended to replace dietary guidelines, then, you know, you might tell people only eat foods that score 100, right? But, you know, raspberries score 100 and asparagus scores 100. But if you just eat raspberries and asparagus, you know, you're going to mm. be pretty sick after a while and you're not going to be. That's not a healthy diet. So so these systems aren't intended to replace food based guidelines. They're intended to within the context of national guidelines, within the context of your own personal preferences and your own dietary patterns, what you are trying to do for your own health. Can you choose a healthier product, especially a processed or packaged product, which are the most mysterious, right, on the on the on the shelf? And so, if you're choosing a bread, if you're choosing an energy bar, if you're choosing a beverage, if you're choosing a cereal, if you're choosing a frozen dinner, if you're choosing a dessert, which which people eat, um, um, you know, can you choose a healthier choice? And so that's that's very different from these systems being used as the foundation for dietary guidance. They're not intended to be the foundation for dietary guidance. They're intended mm -hmm. to be a, a supplementary tool to help people make healthier choices in, in, in the grocery store. I, I think that's important. I was going to ask you, you know, going forward, um, other than the things that you've just mentioned there, how do you, how do you sort of see the food compass being used in the United States, I guess, first and foremost, and, and by whom do you see uh, it becoming a, a front of pack labeling system and you can pick up a food on shelf and it has a food compass score? Is that kind of the direction you're wanting to to go with? Do you see it affect, affecting the food industry in terms of reformulation? What are the, what are the kind of yeah. intended or hopeful uses of it? Well, so, you know, we, we have... Um, um, you know, a website that goes through kind of the food companies and the work we're doing and the, and the FAQs, hopefully you can post it, you know, on, on the link with, with sure. the podcast so people can look. As we've made clear from the start, we're not the implementers of the food companies. We've had 
app developers contact us. We've had nonprofit groups contact us. We've had others contact us and say, we'd love to use Food Compass. For example, we had a nonprofit contact us and said, we're giving kind of double up bucks and healthy incentives for people to buy healthier foods. Right now, we're only doing fruits and vegetables. And if we want to expand, we'd love to be able to use Food Compass to help identify healthier choices or, or other things. So I, we're never going to be the implementers. We've published the algorithm publicly that anybody can take it, anybody can use it, anybody can apply it. I think that once we've, you know, gotten to a place where we think Food Compass is ready for prime time and maybe with, you know, a, a one or two more papers and validation and improvements, I think Food Compass will be, you know, hopefully there. Um, then I think that the use cases are up to the users. And so it could be used for front to pack labeling. Um, in the United States, that would almost certainly be voluntary. So it would be, it's probably difficult to, to make that mandatory, but, but companies could choose to put it on their products. Um, it could be used for employer wellness programs, right? If you, right now your employer insurance pays for you to go to a gym or pays for you to buy, you know, exercise shoes, wouldn't it be great if they paid for healthier foods? And so they could say, you know, you could shop on an online retailer and, and you know, foods that have more than the score, you, 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 could, you, could, you could buy that. It could be used for internal industry goals. And so, you know, if we show it's valid, if we show it works well, if we show it predicts health outcomes, then wouldn't it be great if a retailer like, like a big supermarket said, we're going to make sure that our sales you know, we increase our food compass sales over time, where we give bonuses to our managers if they sell healthier products. Um, it could be used for uh, food manufacturers' reformulation goals, their own reformulation goals. And again, as an example, Nestle, the, the large multinational Nestle, has said that they're going to use Nutriscore and report on Nutriscore every year for their own product reformulation. And so that's Okay, but could it be better than Nutriscore, right? Could we give them a better target than, than Nutriscore? And then lastly, I think, and really interestingly, um, uh, there's the rise of kind of socially conscious investing or what's called the ESG investing, environment, social governance investing. Investors are starting to talk with their dollars and say, we're only going to invest in companies that meet certain social goals like lower carbon footprints. So could this be used for ESG investing and to say, look, we're only going to invest in companies that have healthier products. Um, all of that is predicated on, you know, it working well. And so, you know, right now it works pretty well, but, but we think it could be further improved. And we hope, you know, sometime this year, we'll be able to publish kind of an updated version of the food compass. Very good. And I know at the beginning, we kind of, we spoke about the fact that there's no silver bullet here to, to correct the, the average diet or to, to, to get more people eating a healthy diet, which you outlined at the the beginning. How much do you think can be achieved though through consumer education? So um, helping people when they're standing in front of the shelf, just making that that better choice um, versus, you know, radically changing the food environment such that, you know, when you go into the supermarket or into the gas station. I'm just thinking now the, the petrol stations that I walk into in Australia and looking at all the, the, the kind of quote unquote junk food that's on option, you know, right at the counter there, um, vending machines, hospitals, food courts, etc. you know, short of just radically changing what foods are in the, are in the food environment, how much improvement do you think we can get on the, on the sort of typical diet? So, you know, you might be surprised with this answer since part of our research was food compass. But as you said, you know, I published hundreds of papers and this was two of my hundreds of papers. I, I think radical change is the, is the solution, right? We, we made radical change to fix the problems we had of the 20th century. We need radical change today. I think if we rely on consumer knowledge and consumer education, we're going to have very, very small effects for certain people. And so even for food compass, as I mentioned, the, the use cases aren't just consumer education. It's guiding investing. It's guiding formulation. It's guiding you know, other policies. Um, but the, even that's a small part of the solution. When you have in the United States, you know, one in two adults have diabetes or prediabetes. Three in four adults have overweight or obesity. Um, uh, less than one in 15 adults in the United States are metabolically healthy. One in four teens have, have prediabetes. One in four teens have fatty liver disease. 
um, the system is broken, right? This isn't a problem of individual choice and free will. The system is broken. And so we need to fix the system and we need to get to a place where 95% of the food in the supermarket is good for us. And maybe the other 5% is, is neutral and 95% of food in restaurants and sport venues is good for us. And we don't have to worry so much about, about those choices. And it sounds kind of radical, but it's, it's not. And so I use the example, you could use any other segment of the economy, pick toys and cars as just two examples, right? If, if a mom or dad goes into a toy store and wants to buy toys for their kids, they shouldn't be told 80% of the toys here are bad for you and harmful for your kid and will hurt or maim or kill them. And you have to figure it out. We're going to put labeling and we're going to educate you and you choose. And the toys that are more dangerous are cheaper. They're more likely to be in your neighborhood if you're, if you're lower income or you're a racial ethnic minority. Sorry. We're just going to put out guidelines every five years, toy buying guidelines for Americans and let you navigate the toy store. Right. And if you want to shop, shop around the outside of the toy store. Don't don't shop in the middle of the aisle. Shop around the outside because the toys in the outside tend to be a little bit less dangerous. We don't do that. Right. We say, look, this toy has killed three kids. Let's get it off the market. Right. Or or this car. This car is unsafe. It's airbag didn't deploy. Let's get it off the market. And so somehow for food, it's the only segment of the economy where it's the, it's the, it's the top cause of death in the world. And, and we're allowing this, this top cause of death in the world to be sold in, in our foods. So, so we definitely need radical change. Now, all of that I just said doesn't mean we need radical change by top down, heavy handed nanny state regulation, right? We need to have a suite of things. We need to increase the financial incentives for healthier eating through using healthcare dollars, using procurement, using school meals, using other ways to increase the, the healthier foods. We have to provide financial rewards to innovators and entrepreneurs and companies that are doing the right thing. And we have to have sticks and tax um, uh, uh, penalties for companies that aren't doing the right thing. We should tax soda. We should absolutely tax soda in the United States and globally. There's no reason not to tax soda. It's a, it's a, sugary soda. It's a, it's a, it's a harmful product. So I, I do think we need to have systems changes and we've written on and have sort of a suite of policies to have system changes. And in that big, big wheel of policy options, consumer education is part of the solution because you have to bring the consumer along and they have to be aware of what they're doing. But consumer education by itself, I think Simon is going to have a pretty small, small impact. And so we don't rely on consumers to pick the safe cars when 80% of them are dangerous and we don't rely on consumers to pick safe toys when 80% of them are, are dangerous. We get the dangerous cars and dangerous toys off the road. Ultimately, that should be the goal for the food system. How much of, of that do you feel is reliant on kind of political willpower and, and breaking some of the relationships between the industry and the government and, and the lobbying and stuff that goes on? A lot, but not all, but a lot. Um, a lot of it's dependent on that. And so that's something that we've been at, at, at Tufts University, at the Friedman School, been very active in trying to build relationships with federal and state policy leaders, with agency leaders, um, to try to, to, to move that forward. At the same time, um, you know, while the food sector has used tobacco-like tactics in the past, um, they're not tobacco, right? We don't want to get rid of farmers. We don't want to get rid of supermarkets. We don't want to get rid of restaurants. We don't want to get rid of food manufacturers. They're, we need them to make the food, but we want to shift what they're making, right? And so, and so they're, they're, it's not a fight to the death like it is with tobacco. It's, it's understanding how to take these companies, which have to make a profit or they go out of business, how to help them and push them to, to get to, to, to where, where we want them to go. And, and what's, what's kind of amazing, you know, I want to hopefully end on an optimistic note is, is, you know, I've been in this for about, you know, 20, 25 years. We're at kind of a potential tipping point, Simon, where you have a confluence of COVID-19 showing us how sick we were and that people with diabetes and hypertension and obesity died in the millions, right, compared to people who were, who were healthy you have also the the you know Russia Russia's uh, war in, in Ukraine and other issues showing us the fragility of the food system. You have the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States and elsewhere 
highlighting the incredible racial inequities and structural racism. You have just the, the real awakening of recognition of diabetes and obesity and what it's doing to, to us. And so I think you have a moment where industry actually for, for the first time is saying, hey, maybe we can make money if we start making healthier food and maybe our legacy products, you know, 30 year old, 20 year old people aren't gonna buy them anymore and we have to start changing. And so we're at a potential tipping point where I think the food sector, at least some of them will come to the table and government will come to the table and healthcare will come to the table and science will come to the table and media will come to the table and we could actually get together and fix this, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, if 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 we if we don't lose focus, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's hope so. I appreciate the optimism. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's wrap this up with some practical takeaways for folks listening. It's not it's not often that we get to hear from someone who's done as much research as you on nutrition over decades. Someone listening and they're thinking, okay, I just want to know. What are the, the biggest kind of swaps or substitutions that, you know, I could do? Let's say that, you know, this is a person eating the, the typical standard Western diet. What are, the, what are the big ticket items, the substitutions or the swaps that would bring them the, the sort of biggest return on investment in terms of lowering their risk of those diseases that you just mentioned? Yeah. Well, the, the biggest overall swap would be to, to get most of your food in the grocery store, not in restaurants to start. I mean, food in restaurants, unfortunately, tends to be pretty terrible unless you're paying $100 a plate. And even then, it's it not always good. And so really avoiding the quick serve, quick grab bite food as, as much as possible um, or the chain restaurant as much as possible, unfortunately. There are healthy choices in restaurants. And so if you do go to a restaurant, you know, you can choose salads and seafood and things like that. But, you know, those plates with chips and fries <laughs> tend to be what you see. Right. So I think I think cooking, cooking and, and buying food in the grocery store as much as you can is just a, a, a quick golden rule. Secondly, don't drink your sugar. You know, um, pe people who drink soda switch to, to seltzer. If you can't switch to seltzer, at least switch to diet temporarily as a bridge to switching to, to, to seltzer. Um, don't drink, you know, those those pre-made Frappuccino, pumpkin spice lattes, which have just as much or more sugar than than you know sodas and and, and so on. So don't don't drink your sugar. I think is, is really important. You and I know that, but there's a lot of people who are still drinking their, their sugar. I think I think number three is to not fear fat and don't look for don't don't say oh this food was fatty or it was bad for me. Fat. fat is actually our friend, and so. Um, Use extra virginal olive oil liberally. Eat eat nuts. Use avocados. Ha have salmon, right? Like really, you know, especially plant-based fats. Like that's that's your friend. And then the corollary to that is the overall single worst thing in the food supply is is the refined grains and starches and sugars. And so it doesn't mean to stop eating white bread or to stop eating a refined breakfast cereal or to stop eating crackers. But know that that that's 100% glucose. It's 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 starch is glucose, and so if you want to eat bread or rice or 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 these other starches or candy, obviously just know that it is candy. It's like candy essentially metabolically, and so it's a treat. So have it as a side, make it a small small part of your plate. So and then lastly, I think you know to try to consistent with what you said about quality. Um, we kind of know what a healthy diet looks like, right? We all know it's fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and beans and legumes and vegetables uh, and seafood and yogurt. So to try to fill your plate with that as 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 much as possible. Um, it's but it's not easy, right? That's a that's a that's a tall order for a lot of people. And 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 I and I do want to end Simon to say that also in some of these diet tribe wars, some of these are pretty privileged arguments, right? You know, am I going to have the, is a grass fed Kobe beef that's, you know, raised in a certain farm in a certain way with regenerative agriculture better or worse for me than this or that, right? That's a very privileged argument. So I just think we have to remember too, that there's millions and millions of people around there, billions of people around the world that, that even struggle to know where their next meal comes from. And so we can't just say like, we should all, you know, eat slow food that from hydroponic local gardens that we cooked for three hours at home, right? It's just not realistic for billions of people. So we have to also, I think, 
meet people where they are and, and wherever they are in their food, food journey and food choices and food abilities, help them at least make an incremental change. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a great point, a great reminder. I mean, a lot of these arguments tend to be right at the margins of of society. I think this is a, a good place for us to kind of land the, the plane here. I would love to have you back. I think we could do an entire episode on low fat diets, uh, and and I've got a bunch of questions there. So maybe we save space for another another time. And, and dairy fat, I'd love to talk about dairy fat. Fascinating topic. We can do an entire episode on fat. Uh, is there anything that you wanted to touch on today on the, on the topics that we did cover that we missed or did we kind of get to everything? It all sounds great. And, and hopefully Simon, next time we can do it over a meal. I hope so too. And if folks would like to connect with you to kind of stay in touch with your research, where's the, the best place or places for us to see? Uh, my, my first name dot last name at tufts.edu. So are you starting at tufts.edu and, Again, hopefully for people interested in Food Compass specifically, we can link to that. Also, happy to share links to some of our food policy work. Yep, I'll put links to all of that and the, the various studies that we spoke about into the, the show notes. Uh, brilliant. Thank you so much again for, for joining us today. I, I learned a lot and I know that all the, the listeners will be very grateful for um, your time and, and all of the work that you've done through your career so far. Thank you for your expert uh, moderation. A science communication is not, not simple, and I really appreciate your expertise. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a comment on the YouTube videos or a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, please leave those in the comment section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take notes of these comments when planning for future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.